happy to be here. So we'll get started. I know we are behind on time. So in all, at a macro level, we have four discussion points, and we'll get started. Um, we have all seen, uh, you know, a tech stacks uh, frameworks evolve over time. So to the panel, we'll start off, you know, uh, going back to our journey on how it has evolved, and if it if we were to do it all over again, how would we approach it? That would be the first one. So I'll request Aditya to start off with it. Over to you, Aditya. Thank you, Hari. Uh, so in insurance industry in specific, if we see data is one of the biggest problem for, for us. So we do not get a lot of data from our customers. So either we live with it or we do something about it. So we thought of doing something about it. So in our AI stake, we built the data layer or the data asset as the first layer, where uh, our data assets or data layers uh, get the data uh, get the data for each and every object holistically. So when I say object, an object can be a business, it can be a customer, it can be a location, it can be anything. But we have to get the data of it holistically. So our data team, what our data team did, it uh, augment the data from all the external data sources, all the external data sources, be it structured and unstructured, and get it for a next layer. The next layer that we build is data interpretation layer. Uh, the data interpretation layer, that, as it says, it extracts the information from all these uh, desperate sources. Uh, so all these uh, models that we build were to work models, uh, video to action models and speech to text models are part of this layer. And it's the biggest layer in a, in a whole AI stack. Uh, then the next one is, uh, um, is a casualty, understand casualty layer, where we try to understand what is, what caused what, what is caused by what, and it's more of a feature engineering, feature engineering that we do, it's more, more of uh, that, where we also involve our experts to um, business experts to give some guidance to us and we, we, do, we do consult with them before doing any modeling exercise. Uh, then next layer that we uh, created is a prediction layer uh, where it's, it's all modeling exercise where we try to explain wh why uh, the, that uh, um, target variable that we normally uh, want to explain using all the casualty that we have learned. Um, and then comes uh, explanatory, explanatory layer, where we try to explain why we are making a prediction at overall level and at an individual level as well. So these are the five uh, layers that we have currently in our AI stack. Now, uh, what I have to do differently, I will say I will, not, uh, I will not change these five layers at all. I will add one more layer to it after it. Uh, where I will like to do a lot of simulations, and then we, I want to do some optimizations, or I will, I will like to do some controls. So for example, I, know I have a model which explains x and y's, right? So I can change x and get y, which is simulation, and then I know what I can control y, what I cannot control. So this controllability layer or the, um, or, or the uh, optimization layer is for what parameters should I set which will maximize or which will optimize my Y. So, so that it's not only model which is deployed, I am also getting insight from the model when, uh, what, what is my optimized parameters, what is my op uh, optimized value of X. So that is the extra layer I will add to the current stake and we are already in process of doing it. Great, thank you, Aditya. Over to you, Anshuman. About your yeah, thoughts, so, yeah. uh, you know, from my viewpoint, of course, you know, spanning uh, multiple roles, right? So the way to think about the AI data stack, of course, is, you know, the data layer, you know, the modeling algorithmic layer, and then the operationalizing piece, right? So if I just quickly touch upon, you know, aspects of these three, uh, you know, on the data side, uh, you know, the, the privacy bit has definitely kicked in, uh, you know, over the last, uh, you know, uh, two to three years, right? Uh, how do you make the data secure, private? Uh, so, you know, algorithms, technology that go towards that. Uh, and I think a lot of us here would probably be facing that. Uh, on the modeling side, uh, you know, the transition uh, that uh, at least, you know, I am seeing and I am going through is uh, moving from your classical, 
supervised or unsupervised kind of models to a more reinforcement learning uh, frameworks, right? And, and some of the prerequisites for transitioning to reinforcement learning, right? We, we, we're hearing chat GPT, that's all reinforcement learning based, but even your classical, uh, you know, business problems, uh, right? What it entails is to start tying your predictive, uh, you know, outputs to your actionability, uh, right? To your action set. Uh, for instance, in say customer churn, you figure out someone is going to churn, but then you have a set of strategies that are put into place as to sort of prevent that from happening. And then the reward or the benefit that you get by successfully not having a customer churn. And so, and you know, for reinforcement learning, I think the, the action set and the rewards, reward function, uh, so to speak, right, of the actions once they're put into play, start kicking in and they need to be formalized, they need to be automated, uh, right? and then tied up with a feedback loop uh, back to the modeling or to the data layer, uh, right? Uh, I think, and on the productization side, again, uh, I mean, I think we are, we are all familiar with MLOps uh, becoming big, uh, right? So that will continue to happen. You know, the sophistication there is, is growing, uh, right? And uh, now coming back to, uh, you know, what uh, would I have done differently or some of the learnings, right? Uh, so I think one of the big pieces is, uh, you know, this whole transition to a hybrid kind of an environment. You know, when I started my career, it was everything was on-prem, uh, right? It was all servers, big rooms, uh, right? And then I think over the course of the years, I think we've pretty much ended up with 100% cloud for some reason, uh, right? Uh, but I think especially in data science AI where you have a very key component of experimentation, uh, I think sometimes relying on the cloud where sort of the meter is always running uh, can be fairly prohibitive, right? And I'm sure, uh, you know, a lot of people here would experience that. So I think there is that optimal, uh, you know, combination of cloud and on-prem, uh, which I think will serve us uh, best. All right. Thank you. Over to you, Arvind. Yeah, this is my experience over the last 15 years, right? In terms, we've actually seen a transition of what kind of technologies and stacks have been used and the kind of solutions that have been developed. So broadly, we've seen uh, for companies moving in from licensed and on-prem based uh, technology stack to a more open source and a cloud-based technology stack. And that is the future. Uh, if you were to ask me like, hey, what would you have done differently? I think one of the uh, biggest focus areas, at least from my perspective, having service customers is uh, a lot more emphasis has to be put in terms of ensuring that you have the right kind of data that you want to uh, analyze, right? And data quality becomes a very critical component. I think that's a lot. Uh, it is understated a lot, but it is, has a very uh, significant impact. So that's probably one area where I look at in terms of investing more in terms of making sure that we have the right kind of quality of data to do the analysis. That makes sense. I think uh, keeping an eye on the time, we'll move to the second question. Um, can you, uh, you know, dwell upon some of the pain points you have solved um, using contemporary technologies, you know, using conversational AI, image processing, computer vision, uh, you know? See, uh, so uh, we are basically an analytic services company, so the, the advantage that it gives us is that we get to work with uh, customers across domains uh, solving different uh, kinds of uh, business problems, right? So um, some impactful ones that come to my mind were specifically we did one um, uh, a project for one of uh, global commodity procurement giants, right? And their, the intent was to leverage um, a data that was traditional in terms of structured data. And then you had to leverage satellite imagery data primarily to look at uh, analyzing what, how is the crop yield coming along? Or what are the drivers of crop yield? Are the, is the health of the crop good enough, right? Uh, that enabled them to kind of take uh, more preventive action to make sure that uh, they're able to kind of get to the kind of supplies that they were looking at. So that was one interesting use case that uh, uh, had an impact both from a social as well as a corporate uh, standpoint. Um, another interesting use case we did for a consumer packaged goods manufacturer uh, leveraging computer vision technologies was in, in bringing a lot of improvement in their uh, sales effectiveness, right? So they have contracts with various retail firms in trying to understand whether the retailers are compliant with the kind of um, displays that they have to put in the store. So uh, we built a computer vision uh, based solution which helped uh, accelerate the whole process of uh, looking at the data through computer vision uh, models, right? And then 
making, uh, bringing out metrics in terms of the compliance rate. So that this reduced the cycle time of uh, compliance adherence from like four days to two days. And it also uh, catered to the geographical or I would say network limitations, especially for this uh, global player, which is like well, operating in multiple countries. So you had uh, the vision uh, model or vision solutions actually being built on the edge, right? So that was one another critical uh, solution that we were a part of. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. I think, how about you, Anshuman? No. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, on the digital uh, marketing side, uh, right, one of the uh, use cases that we are sort of currently using at Futurins to, to optimize our, you know, marketing strategy is around what is called, uh, you know, uh, dynamic creative optimization. So there, you know, you take either, you know, video ads or image ads and sort of parse them and, you know, create insights out of them, right? So in terms of, um, you know, what's the tonality uh, of your videos or, you know, you can extract out the color palette from images and, uh, you know, within marketing, you know, different uh, colors sort of evoke different kind of, uh, you know, emotions. Right, so suppose you are trying to evoke, uh, you know, emotions of trust and value. You know, you would use colors like, say, you know, blue and white and gray uh, as the background for some of the creatives, uh, you know, you would make. Right, similarly, if you are trying to uh, evoke emotions of, you know, dynamism, you know, opportunity, uh, energy, you know, you would go to the other side of the spectrum, right? You know, bold colors, yellow, red, oranges, and so on. And then you sort of need to, and you could be giving out both these messages, right? So as a brand, I might be going out uh, to a certain segment, uh, you know, highlighting my, you know, trust and value proposition, mm -hmm. uh, while going to others, uh, you know, talking about my dynamism and energy and excitement, right? Mm -hmm. And also, you know, how the imagery, et cetera, sort of coordinates with the message, you know, the textual message that you're putting on the ads, uh, right? So, you know, that has been a sort of a use case of, um, you know, uh, image processing and so on, uh, right? Got it. Thank you. Quick minute from you, Aditya. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, normally we see insurance as we buy the insurance, pay the premium, and uh, if some incident happens, we claim and get the, get, get the claim from the insurance companies. But what is it where insurance company can do something preventive? So, we... Is, spend some time thinking aloud what we can do as a preventive measures in insurance domain. So I give two examples, quick two examples. So there are a lot of, uh, uh, in, in cold countries, there are a lot of pipe bursts that happen because uh, the temperature goes down, it will convert into ice and, the, and, the, and it's expand and the pipe will burst. So what we can do, we, we did some IT, IoT solutions there. So we put sensors and then uh, give preventive uh, alerts to the company, uh, to, the, to the places where we are, uh, we, we are deploying it, and so that they can take preventive actions and, and, uh, and um, uh, preserve, uh, pre prevent, the, prevent the final burst, pipe burst that are happening. And the second use case that I will say is uh, uh, in worker compensation domain, if we see there are a lot of injuries happen to workers, so can we do something about it? So one of the major, major portion of claims is uh, uh, injuries during lifting and lifting heavy objects. So are their posture not correct? So can we do something about it? So we use computer vision techniques uh, to tell that these postures are not correct. You should not lean this way. You should not, uh, um, uh, you should not carry the heavy weights in this posture. And hence, a pre preventive action can be taken at the client uh, place itself. So those type of things we, we are doing in this space right now. Got it. At uh, Rakuten, since we are a conglomerate into multiple verticals, you know, be it e-commerce, fintech, mobile network operations, we use, um, you know, conversational AI in a couple of areas. One is in the standard customer support area. The other one, basically, sales and pre-sales, you know, we have started to use uh, conversational AI there. Uh, when it comes to vision, we have a research wing which is deeply into uh, medical imaging and whatnot. So we are into uh, you know cancer detection and whatnot. We have used and you know we have had multiple um, you know interactions with local hospitals as well. 
uh, you know, working closely with, uh, for example, just yesterday we were meeting a group from HCG uh, trying to see how best we can fit in from a bioinformatics uh, perspective and uh, doing, you know, basically it's aiding as a tool for the uh, surgeons and physicians. Thank you. I think we'll move on to the third uh, topic. Um, personalization and privacy, they don't go well with each other. So, and of course, there's always ethics and governance, right? So, very curious on Anshuman how, you know, you have reconciled to the fact that, you know, you know, that we have to play along the compliance, but at the same time, solve problems for our customers. Sure, yeah, I think very uh, sort of important uh, aspect and, you know, getting even more important uh, as we go into the future, uh, right? So, uh, you know, you bring up a great point around uh, sort of personalization and privacy. Uh, right, and then if I add a third layer to it, right, so there's personalization, privacy, and also accuracy, uh, right? It's almost like, a, you know, you have to triangulate uh, between uh, these three aspects, right? So you can always, you know, make everything very private by, uh, you know, multiple uh, techniques, right? You just uh, don't store that data for one, but then uh, you know, the, the obviously personalization takes a hit, but then there's no, not really any insights or modeling uh, that you can, um, you know, sort of really do, uh, right? So in terms of privacy, I think there are, um, you know, a number of um, sort of emerging techniques uh, like things, um, you know, differential privacy or synthetic data. Uh, you know, these are two areas that, uh, you know, uh, I have personally sort of worked on, right? So in differential privacy, uh, the way it works in sort of very sim simple terms, you start adding, you know, noise to the data, right? And you have, you know, some mathematical algorithms that give you a guarantee of uh, your end output when you use that data to do statistical analysis, etc., will be within certain bounds, right? Just to give a sort of fairly trivial example, suppose you have the heights of, uh, you know, 100 people, which average out to 68 inches, for instance, right? So you can essentially, uh, you know, sample particular distributions and start adding or subtracting uh, values from each of the heights of these 100 people with the guarantee that the average, right, if that is one of the statistical measure uh, of the distribution of the data will not vary beyond, you know, 0.5 inches. Right? So you, while the individual values would have varied much more than that. Right? So differential privacy-based uh, algorithms uh, you know, are, are one piece of it. Uh, synthetic data is a, is a, is a big part uh, of dealing with um, you know, uh, privacy concerns. So you know, the way that would work is that you, know, you have the real data, you train a model on that. Right? And then you sort of discard the data. Right? Because the, the data... Uh, you know, the private information is in the, e the, the values of each of those rows of your data on which the model has been trained, right? So once you have the model, uh, you can actually plug in values for your Xs, right, or the features, which again are different from the real people or the real data, and then generate a synthetic sort of data set. Uh, which can then, you know, be taken forward for analysis or modeling or, you know, learning and so on, right? So, sort of that's on the, uh, I think, the privacy side of things. Uh, on the governance uh, side, you know, uh, I have always been a big believer of, uh, you know, explainability and interpretability. Uh, I think a, a, a large number of challenges uh, arise because, you know, we, we don't, understand why a particular, uh, you know, decision is being taken or, you know, why a particular output has come out, right? So, you know, explainability at the model level, uh, right, as, as well as explainability at the local level, right? So, you know, we were, we've heard a lot of insurance or credit-based uh, uh, talks, right? So when an individual is scored uh, for whether they should be given, uh, you know, some credit or not, I mean, they, through an AI model, I mean, there needs to be some explanation uh, provided back, right? And, and that also sort of ties up into things like, you know, doing a sensitivity analysis or counterfactual analysis where you tell the person that had your, you know, uh, spends been X, Y, Z or had you not defaulted, uh, you know, instead of defaulting 10 times, suppose had you only defaulted 
five times or two times, you would have made the cut. Sure. Right? So that sort of helps that, that explanation which a human would have given, uh, right, needs to come through from the AI as well. Got it. Quick 30 seconds from you and then... Uh, sure. Back. So first of all, uh, I will talk about uh, ethics, right? So what we are trying, we are training machine on a data which is produced by human on a, uh, and we are trying to optimize something that is set by human and then when machine is amplifying the bias, we are saying it's not ethical, right? And it's not ethical and that is where a risk is arising and we being in, into insurance, risk is something we analyze a lot. So, and this is something we have foreseen for, for long that as we adopt more and more AI, Sometime a governance process will come in and, and we have to be compliant to that. So we have set up a small uh, governance team within, within CHIRP uh, where, we are trying to, where we are trying to involve some, some people from business, some people from data science domain and come up uh, for each model what are, the, what are the segments which are more prone to bias by the model. So those are the minimum criteria that we are trying to find out. Those are the minimum segments that we are trying to find out whether the model is biased or not in addition to what uh, uh, we are giving as, as, a, as a default. Got it. So, Got it. so yes. yeah, if we can move to Arvind. Yeah, a, yeah please go ahead. Yeah. Pretty much uh, they both have summarized so what, what, are what the you factors, have in mind. Right? Let's yeah. move to the fourth point then. Um, you know, uh, key takeaways, right? One or two key takeaways over the years on the people, product, process, front, you know, being in the data and AI uh, area, right? would love to hear from each of you. Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, by the way, love the PPP framework, uh, <laughs> yes. right, big. <laughs> uh, so I think if on the product side, I think, uh, uh, you know, one of the key sort of learnings or takeaways uh, for me has been that, you know, it's very, very important to tie uh, things to actionability and decisions, right? And, and I think, uh, you know, we have seen that, that uh, over the years, that, that uh, chart which shows, you know, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, prescriptive, right? I think that's like uh, that legendary uh, image. But I think it's extremely important to be there at that prescriptive level, right? Uh, I think a lot of the times, um, you know, we end up with what are called, you know, insight-based products or, you know, predictive products but are not able to tie them to, uh, you know, actual decisions, right? So, and I think it's sometimes, a lot of the times, you know, organizations that are stuck at that level is, uh, you know, they, they struggle with showing value uh, with AI uh, and data science and, and so on, right? So, I think moving to that uh, is, uh, I mean, I don't think it is a good to have at this point. Uh, I mean, it's a must have survival kind of need. And I think uh, just, uh, concluding on the people and process uh, side of things, you know, one of the uh, approaches that, uh, you know, I've had great success with is uh, sort of designing uh, work in, in this whole delivery plus discovery kind of mode, right? So delivery uh, work is your, you know, scrum based, agile, uh, you know, based approaches to, you know, building the product, delivering and so on. But, you know, 10 to 15% of the, your time or your team's time uh, definitely needs to be put into, you know, more exploratory uh, work so that that then creates the delivery work, you know, six months down the road. Got it. 20 seconds from each and then... Yeah, yeah. maybe I'll just focus on the people side of things based on what we've seen, right? I, I, open source and cloud-based technologies will be the way to go, right? And that's something that uh, we as individuals will have to focus on. The second piece is uh, not just looking at a solution in silos, right? So you're looking at... Uh, an integrated solution, so it will essentially become uh, uh, building the skills to be, be a full stack uh, solution uh, player, right? That's the second thing. And third one is where I think will become a differentiator for people will be more in terms of bringing in that domain and uh, the ability to uh, cross leverage ideas from across industries to solve problems. So those are the three, I would say, key factors from a people side that will become very important for us in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, from people stand, uh, from people expect, what I think uh, that this should be a continuous learning, no doubt about it, with this fast-paced uh, uh, progress that we are seeing in AI. If we do not learn continuously, we are we are lacking behind. Uh, from the product perspective, uh, so we see product as a platforms 
which, are, which should be scalable, which should be very generic because we are across 54 countries and if we start building platform for each and every country, then it will be like a, a, a very long road map. So that is second thing, and it should be it should have microservices within it. So there are multiple components within a platform, so they should talk with each other through microservices um, like APIs internally. So those that is about uh, uh, product platform, and the processes. Uh, so processes should be uh, should be there should 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 be there optimally. It should not be too much and too less as well. Uh, why not too much? If it is too much, then your plan will be on the paper. Only it will there will be nobody to execute it, and if it is on, uh, if it is too less, then the productivity of the individual will be very less. Got it. I think I'll share just one. Um, basically, I feel there is one science which is above data science, that is money science, and uh, this we discovered when we were working on some hard problems in Geo. Uh, before the 4G rollout happened and, you know, we had worked on a whole bunch of segmentation problem, ARPU, what plan, what not, and then the executive leadership came out and said, look, forget all this, I'm going to roll it out for three or six months for free. With that, I think we'll end this session. Thank you very much.